<laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm absolutely delighted that I have a colleague, someone I've known since, he says, 1986, when we first met at a cult conference, Joe Zimhart, jo Joseph Zimhart. Joe's uh, an artist. Joe is a cult information specialist. He's been helping people get out of cults forever. Uh, he also is, uh, works as a mental health professional, I believe, uh, diagnosing people who are coming in for uh, psychiatric uh, evaluation and treatment, I believe. Mm -hmm. So Joe, I wanted to use this opportunity. You've written your story, Santa okay. Fe, Bill Tate and Me, How an Artist Became a Cult Interventionist. And um, I've always respected you. you. You read voraciously. You write reviews, um, you have a great website, which we'll plug. But uh, Joe, I wanted you to give, give people an introduction <laughs> to who you are, how you got interested in this wacky field and some highlights about what uh, is going on these days. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. By the way, I, I don't diagnose people that come in. I process them for the psychiatrist that does the diagnosis. Thank you for <laughs> correcting me. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, I, and, and I know a little bit about you. You got interested in a cult that I, came to my attention in the, in the 80s, Church Universal and Triumphant uh, of Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Um, but let's hear a little bit about your story and how you came to get interested in the whole subject of destructive cults. Yeah, it, I had a, an odd avenue into it. Um, everyone has a different way to get into that constricted behavior, right? And it was through the art world. I had uh, graduated from the Pennsylvania Academy in Philadelphia, and I, my marriage was on the rocks, my first marriage, and we separated. And so I decided to uh, pack up my pickup truck and move out to Santa Fe and live in the truck camper and explore that area to see if I'd want to live there. My first day in town, I met this guy, Bill Tate, in his gallery, and um, I talk about that. But uh, I was looking for some direction when I went out there, and, and it, was a, it, was, it was an art town, 200 art galleries, the third largest art market in the United States, international. So, you know, so I, I, I was in the right place. The other thing, I had a skill doing portraits very quickly, and I did them at Atlantic City on the Steel Pier when it was still doing that kind of thing uh, for part of my summer income when I was at the Academy. The plaza in Santa Fe had artists doing that kind of thing, so I applied for a license, and, and I did it for 14 years there. I sketched about 7,000 heads during that 14 year period. So Santa Fe, but I don't remember meeting you back when, but I've been yeah. to Santa Fe numerous. Well, it was a summer thing, you know, and, and you know, and then the state fairs and, and sure. inside malls during Christmas. That's sure. when that business was good. So I stumbled onto Nicholas Rorich's uh, teachings through a magazine and in Bill Tate's gallery, it was American magazine featured this Agni Yoga guy. I never heard of them, and, and I felt drawn to this mystic artist. It, 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 artists were very, I mean, the, the paintings were kind of interesting. So I started to pursue that. I visited the Agni Yoga Center in New York City. It's up at 107th and Riverside. I got to know them. They never pressured me to join, and I never did join, but I read all the books. Later, I, I found out about this I Am group in New Mexico, and I, I really couldn't join them. They, they were kind of the St. Germain Foundation thing, and they were a branch of theosophy with a lot of new thought, meaning affirmations and decrees and positive thinking. Uh, the I am activity was also very right wing, virulently anti-liberal, anti-left. In fact, their first members back in the 30s were uh, William Pelly Silver Shirts that had left his group and joined the I am. They were fascists, American fascists. Wow. And they, they upheld Hitler as kind of a hero back then. And now we're going back to 1932. And Hitler wasn't, you know, what he what he came out to be later on among American fascists. He was considered a hero of sorts. Um, but you didn't know this when you got involved, right? <laughs> well, I, I didn't know it till later. And, and uh, 
uh, the IM, interestingly, didn't allow me to, to join in with their decree sessions, which the main activity is to sit there and decree for two, three hours a day, a rapid form of chanting where you invoke a god or a, or a, a ascended master, and then a, a color ray, like the blue ray or the red ray, or, I mean, not the red ray, that's verboten, the pink ray. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the chants that I learned with an offshoot of the IM, the, the Church Universal and Triumphant later, uh, you know, would be, I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires, you know. So you invoke this thing, this energy of violet fire that cleanses your body of all sin and impurities and uh, transforms you. And by saying, I am, you bring the energy of God into yourself, right? right. So all of their decrees invoke the I great. am. Yeah, the, the I am that I am, correct, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this is borrowed from early Rosicrucianism. It's part of Masonry. It goes back into Hermeticism, you know, during the Renaissance. And, and, and it kind of came into the modern era through Theosophy, the I Am, and, and all these groups. The I Am leaders would not let me join in because when they interviewed me, there were two of the five leaders of the organization at the time. I had admitted that I had used psychedelic drugs, like a lot of people in the 60s did. I experimented with this stuff. And they said, well, in our experience, people that did that kind of thing can't handle the energy in our group. In other words, they're hippies that freaked out during decree sessions is what happened, I think. Uh -huh. They wouldn't, so they said, well, this in this lifetime, you shouldn't come into these teachings. You could read a couple of the books because I have a hole in my aura, they told me. Did you have long hair? That was me back picture? then. Yeah. That's what I, that's you, so you were look, looking like a hippie, buddy. Well, I was working next door at an art supply store. I was dressed for work. It's and I took, yeah, anyway, I was kind of hippie back then. Um, it, it's before I got caught up in cut, which expected you to keep your hair real short, men. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, the I am wouldn't let me in because I had a hole in my aura <laughs> because of psychedelic drug use, they said. I didn't know what the hell that meant. So I just gave up on them. I stuck with the Agni Yoga. I met some friends of mine that I also met the first day in Santa Fe. And later they told me they were part of this group called Church Universal and Triumphant. And the reason they told me all about this, because they were secretive about it, was they found out I had been studying these Agni Yoga teachings. And the Agni Yoga teachings were at the highest level of the Summit Lighthouse or Church Universal and Triumphant. So I thought, well, I'm already in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then they told me that the youngest daughter of Elizabeth Prophet, by the way, Prophet's the real name of Mark Prophet, Elizabeth Prophet. It's Spelled not a made-up name. Prophet of God, right? No, they, they didn't make it up. It's it's their legal early no, name. No, no, I mean prophet. it's spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-T, like a prophet. Like a prophet of God. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Steve. So they told me that uh, Helena Rorich was the uh, reincarnate, or reincarnated as the youngest daughter, Tatiana, of Elizabeth Prophet, you know, which intrigued me more. And then, then they said that, that they combined the I am teachings with the Agni Yoga teachings, you know, and I had already studied this stuff because I was reading the I am books and it was kind of like, uh, you know, ready-made cult for me. And I walked in, I went to three of their conferences. The, by the third conference, I was getting sour on, I was being seeing, seeing a lot of conf, uh, contradictions uh, for instance, and in, in, in this started around the beginning of 1980, the, the, the Agni Yoga accepted black and red in, in, as colors within their schemes. You know, Rorch wore black costumes and, and one of their books was a red cover. Black and red were forbidden colors in the, the cosmic scheme of the I Am and, and Church Universal. So you weren't supposed to wear them on your, on your person. Uh, you know, that so that was just one contradiction. There were dozens coming up in my mind. I go, I started backing off from it. The other thing is an artist, um, you know, I did portraits for a living. So you use a lot of muddy colors, black, red, orange, red, you know, whatever. And they were saying that these colors could be harmful to your aura. Certain colors like black, like red, like orange, like brown, like gray. So I'm conflicted now as an artist. How the hell do I be a spiritual person and live a real life, you know? So no one could answer that question for me in the group. Um, so I, I, I backed away with a lot of struggle. I mean, I had panic attacks that summer in, in 1980 when I 
broke away from the group thinking that I had done something wrong. I mean, there was this thing about, you know, that, that you would have to suffer 10,000 reincarnations before you had a chance to get back into the path of, of ascension again. Yeah, that's that kind of thing. Phobia and indoctrination. Phobia yeah. indoctrination was huge in this group. Yeah. Right. So I didn't get over the panic attacks until, uh, and I write about this in the book, I, you know, being a Catholic, I still had some affinity with the church. I'd visit home and I'd go to church with my parents, for instance, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew this Carmelite nun who was uh, part of the front office, because Carmelites are sequestered, you can't see them. But there was a center there in Santa Fe, a uh, uh, Carmelite monastery, and I knew this little diminutive nun, five foot or four foot ten, and she was a, had been a grandmother already, and she became a nun late in life. And I uh, I went in there and I said, Sister, I'm having a real problem with something. Can I talk to you? You know, because I had, I didn't know who to talk to. Good for you. And uh, she didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I am Theosophy, you know. And after about ten minutes of listening to me, she said, Joseph, let me pray with you. So. She just prayed, and, and just that kind act did something to me psychologically, and I began to cry for the first time in this struggle. Mm. I left her, you know, thanking her, and I, I started feeling hot. I mean, my body was on fire, literally. I, I, I just, it wasn't a fever, and I stood in a cold shower for some time after that to cool down, you know. And, and, but, but what happened, it was psychosomatic, Steve, if, yeah. if you understand what I'm saying. Of course. It's like a somatic reaction, a release. I started thinking a lot more clearly. I, all the phobias left me. I mean, right. it was the best therapy I could have gone through. Yep. I was no longer afraid of black magicians and all this shit I was learning about in theosophy. It just disappeared. And uh, so I started reading the critical books with an open mind, you know, and, and, and drinking this stuff in and doing this research that led to who I am today. Yeah. Can uh, I ask but, a quick question? Were you yeah. told in your cult, like so many other cults, you can't discuss the inner teachings with any outsiders? Right. Because if that was the case, and then you started talking to the nun, you were breaking the, the, the programming. Well, right? here, here's the mantra. Uh, and it goes way back to occultism and in, in, in the Rosicrucians and, and the Masons and all to know, to dare, to do, and to be silent. So when you're involved in the occult, you don't talk about it because- Sorry, laugh. Well, think about this. You don't cast your pearls before swine, right? You heard that one a few hundred times. Yes. So, so you kind of keep it to yourself and you treat people normally. Um, you only talk about it openly with people in the inside of, of, of the particular system, right? That's it's a self-sealing system. right? Yeah. That's they tell people to keep mm -hmm. them in that mindset. Right. And it works really well. I mean, it keeps you from getting critical information, right? Right. <laughs> so. But thank goodness we want to know the truth and we don't like to be deceived. And, you know, all these mm -hmm. groups deceive by withholding information or distorting it. Yeah. Right or just yeah. Well, for me, it was the internal comp contradictions. I just couldn't handle it anymore, and I, I, that's when I started to break down, so to speak, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and become more self-critical. And but but uh, you know, like I said, you know, people have different ways of breaking loose from this type of thing. I just happen to have a Catholic connection to it, and, yeah. and like I said, it whether it's miraculous or spiritual or something else, it, it doesn't. It's not part of my narrative, but but it did create a psychosomatic reaction that was very therapeutic for me, you know, and I'm meaning therapeutic in the old Greek sense, you know, the, the, the therapeutic were the actors in these Greek theater, which caused these emotional reactions in the audience mm -hmm. to cleanse them of, of things. And, and this was like therapy for Greeks to go to the theater back yeah. then. But I, I would just say from all the research, because I, as a mental health professional, I'm reading all the research I can, I can get on healing and what causes healing and just having somebody listen to you mm -hmm. and be respectful to you, especially someone perceived as an authority figure right. who says you're going to be okay, right. has a great effect. And oh, yeah. my experience, and I'm sure you, you'll validate this, I think, uh, is by being an ex-member ourselves and sharing our story, if we're working with somebody in a cult, we're talking from our own experience. So we're in a sense, we're role modeling that there's life after cult, you know? Right. 
that we're not going to be struck by lightning. We're not going to, you know, be run over by cars, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So how you know, I've used the start? same thing in, in, in my exit counselings, uh, you know, many hundreds of them, but, you know, very often people are involved in groups where they believe the guru has magical power, exactly. occult power or tantric power or some bullshit like that. And, and uh, so I'm this, 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 heavy open critic never hiding my name nothing all these years and you know and i i'd have to ask him i go well wh where's this power you know i'm i'm calling the guy a jerk i'm tearing off his mask and i'm one of the healthiest people i know at my age you know i'm almost 73 now <laughs> you look marvelous i'm only six. I, I don't i know but i don't take any pills Right. You no, know, I don't. My blood pressure is fine. I mean, I've had some issues. You know, my hearing's going. My sight isn't great, but you know what I mean, Steve. So, where is this occult power? You know, what happened? Now, now, you know, and I've criticized hundreds of these powerful gurus o over the years. Yeah, and I, I, I actually, I'm sure you've done the same in cases where I'm, you're with somebody who's so yeah. afraid of the mystical powers. You go, okay, you know, get me, you know. You're yeah. an asshole. You're a jerk. You're a false <laughs> prophet. You're a this. You're a that. And okay, well, when's it going to happen? Yeah, I've never gone that far. I mean, table for how long <laughs> we have to wait before I get zapped. You know. Yeah, don't play with fire, Steve. You might get burned. <laughs> uh, and I got. I have to add this insert. It's so crazy. But I was on uh, a Church Universal Triumphant had a show on Oprah Winfrey because she. I remember it. about the bombing. And there were 50 cult, cult members doing the smash, blast, destroy, annihilate, consume decree on me. I was told later yeah. for a week, 24 7, they rotated members to blast me. And I'm like, hi, I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> anyway. Well, you know that, that smash, blast, annihilate was the old I am movement that developed them. Cut didn't use them except in the inner core. Uh, they didn't. They didn't. You know. They didn't want to be known to be saying that stuff because the I am was outed on that, and in the courts when when they went to court in 1940 uh, through 1946, all that information about their teachings came out in public. It was in the court record, oh. and they used to chant against Roosevelt, smash, blast, an island, and consume and crucify him. I mean, all this stuff was in their decrees about trying oh. to. They believed in the magic power of words because, you know, as the story goes, God created the universe by speaking it into existence, right? And and the name it and claim it Christians do the same thing. They, they, they have that same occult idea about the power of the word. Yep, that's great. So talk, tell us about how you decided to start helping other people. Well, um, I wasn't looking to do that. Uh, I, I wanted to get the hell out of this stuff, get back to my art career, you know, and, and, and just, 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 Get away from it. You know, it, it, it's just a part of my life that was somewhat embarrassing. Right. So I know friends of mine what is, you're talking about, Joe, about feeling embarrassed. <laughs> or ashamed. Yeah. I just bowed to a floor in front of a fat Korean billionaire who yeah, right. liked to gamble and have sex with lots of girls. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Yeah. So uh, the the. The, the some of the members in the group, three of them especially, that knew me really well and loved me. Uh oh, we recruited me a couple. Called me up and said, you know, we heard you're not going to the teachings anymore because I, I had boxed up a bunch of stuff and taken it back to them because you weren't, you know, I didn't want it. And they acted like it was contaminated. They didn't really want to touch it, you know, because I said I was leaving the teachings. But this couple found out later because they didn't live in the, the cult house anymore in Albuquerque. And they uh, asked me to come over because they were having problems also, that, you know, after five years in. And I had been only in like a year, more or less, not as much as they were. They had invested $40,000 that they had to get back out into the cult house. Wow. It took them a few years to get their money back. Um, but they talked to me for like four hours in their living room and after four hours, they were out. And all I did was shared at that time was relatively primitive information as to what I know now about what I understood about Ascended Masters, the background of theosophy, Blavatsky's plagiarisms, 
uh, the IM background, you know, where Guy Ballard was, uh, was a thief, basically, when he was a young, younger psychic, and he was exposed in Chicago, running these gold mine scams and stuff. And so he, he was, he was quite the charlatan. And, uh, you know, before he launched his I am movement. And so when they heard all that, they, you know, it just kind of fell apart in their minds. It was like a house of cards, you know, you pull the base card out, yeah. Blavatsky and Ballard, and, and there was nothing left for them. Now, as far as Agni Yoga, I hadn't sorted that out yet, you know, as much. It took me another year and a half <laughs> after that. But that also fell apart. But yeah. that didn't matter because, you know, it, this thing, this mystique was gone for them and they left the group. And so did someone else I talked to in the group. But, but the key event, which I write about in my book that got me involved in exit counseling, I think was I was doing portraits at the, at the mall in Santa Fe, the DeVargas Mall for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And a young lady at 19 years old that worked there came up to me with her picture and wanted me to do a pastel sketch from her picture for her fiance. I said, fine, I get this stuff a lot. And I would work on it off and on as a shill to get people to watch me work before they sat for portraits, right? And she would come up and talk to me during slow periods early in the day in the mall. And she started trying to recruit me into her little four square gospel church that was in town run by a pastor. There were maybe 30 members or 40 members. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to her and, and I'm finding out she's in like a cult thing, right? So I started talking to her about my experience because Elizabeth Prophet used the King James Bible, the old version, and so did her cult leader. Uh -huh. I found a lot of contradictions in the King James, especially in quoting from Isaiah about using God's energy, commanding, command ye me, there's a sentence in there. And there's several other passages in there that, that in other versions of, of the Bible are better translated. But cult people like using the old King James because, man, there's a lot of stuff in there you can really manipulate your population with, right? Yeah. So when she started hearing my comparisons and my story, you know, the, about this, she... she got thinking and cause she'd been in this group only six months and she hadn't talked to her parents. They cut her off from her folks. Wow. So when Christmas came around, you know, I had the portrait was done and, and, and she came to me and told me, she goes, I decided to send the portrait to my parents. I'm no longer getting married to this guy. And I backed out of the church and I wanted to make sure she was okay. You know, she was fine. The people she was living with, you know, were worried about her anyway. Mm. And uh, she was renting from them. So I didn't hear from her again. So a month later, I have this ticket round the world trip to go to India and, and other places uh, for a three month thing. It was a, a deal that you could go stand by. And I was doing it as part of a recovery and research project for myself. Um, I made sure my daughter, who was two and a half at the time, was OK with my ex-wife and her then husband. Uh, we had gotten divorced in the middle of this uh, cult mm -hmm. stuff that I was in. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh so I, I packed up my things. I had moved into Bill Tate's gallery for a couple of weeks before I left on this round the world trip to just to have somewhere to stay. And I was um, about two days before I left, I had driven my truck to a gas station and I was pumping gas and this car is there. And this, this guy is saying, I hear my name called out, Joe, are you Joe Simhart? And I'm looking and he's coming up to me and he's saying, you know, I, I, I need to talk to you, you know. And so he, he, he says, and then I hear a voice and it's this young girl, Lisa or whatever her name was, I forget now. She said, that's my dad, Joe. Hi, you know. I, had, I didn't have a telephone at the time. I cut off so no one could contact me. She couldn't uh -huh. contact me. So he came up and, and, and the wife came out, you know, her parents, and they, they took me to dinner. And uh, they were just effusively thanking me for saving their daughter, right? And I thought, what the hell? I didn't Doesn't do anything. Doesn't it feel amazing? So we all prayed together. They were Baptists. I mean, you know, she was in a, a self-sealing Christian system yep. that was much more strict than the Baptist uh, thing that she grew up in. Yep. You know, so the mother saying, you know, God sent you to my daughter and all this stuff. And man, the last thing I wanted to hear was some divine agency shoving my my world around you know right. i wasn't into that at that point and uh right. but i was gracious to them and, and i've never heard from them again that was it right but that that one experience was was my model basically for my entire exit counseling career after that 
Yeah. You know, it, it impacted me so much. I realized how this extends into the family system. And, and, and just by talking to someone with the right information, educating them, essentially, you can change their whole goddamn life. You know, it's yeah. a, it was an amazing experience, really. Yeah, totally. I feel yeah. I can relate in a way that a lot of people yeah. can't. Um, right, right. But I wasn't looking for it. Do you see what I mean? I wasn't absolutely. looking to do it. And then it wasn't until 1985, 86, when I began working with a, kind of a little cult uh, counseling group in Santa Fe. I was their chairman for seven years. I decided then in 1985 to go to the a CAN conference because I had been hearing about it. I met Margaret Singer in 1982. Oh. She interviewed me back then about cut because she had a court case coming up. And I had, she had gotten a paper I had written called Confessions of a Spiritual Idiot that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I kind of exposed my, 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 you know, experience with cut in the I am in it. And um, so uh, you still have the paper. I still have a copy of it. Yeah. Is it it, it, it went around by snail mail, you know, back then it, it got copied on, on, on mimeograph machines. Or I remember. I used and it used to, to get cases. spread around, you know, all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. When I did cases, I had to carry pounds and pounds yes. of, co of photocopied yeah. stuff. And so that's how I got known through that paper because Marilyn Malik, who was a critic of cut. You yeah. remember her? Of course. Her son was in the group, and uh, they ended up on 60 Minutes opposing each other in, in 1983, I think it was. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was a 60 Minutes show on cults, and they featured her as a grieving mother and the son as, as this devotee who had ran away from a deprogramming attempt. Yeah. You know, they were trying to hold him in a, in a trailer. The security wasn't very good, and he got away after an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so anyway, that was like a, a thing, you know, of, of, of that 60 Minutes wanted to. Um, so anyway, my paper got around the network, so to speak. And I got known as this person that's willing to talk about cut and, and similar cults. Mm -hmm. So the programmers and exit counselors uh, that met me during that conference, and I mean the programmers in the old style that did van pickups and lock people up for, in yep. a room. Yeah, I did that for a year, and it was, yeah. wasn't for me. No, it wasn't me for me either. And I, I, you know, it was probably during that six-year period where I participated in that stuff, about ten percent of my caseload. It wasn't like I was doing right. a lot of it anyway. But right. I, I learned exactly what it was, and and I knew some of the players in it. A, a, a lot of them were in it for the money. I mean, it, it was bad. It was it yeah. was a dark area in in the intervention world. On the other hand, I did a lot of good. People that I did get, 100%. you know, they, they, they thanked me forever that I helped them out. They didn't mind being picked up and put in a house. They enjoyed the conversation, actually. Yep. Yeah. No, uh, I retreated I, very I, well. Yeah. So it depended if there was a lot of resistance or not to it after the first few hours. Because usually once I would gain rapport with someone in a situation like that, you could send a security home. You know, yeah. they were willing to listen. So that yeah, was that my goal. Was the whole point was just to get their attention and that not was have a cult hovering over their shoulder. telling. Yeah, the them. problem, it was illegal, right? <laughs> That's why I stopped. They stopped yeah. giving conservatorships. But I only did it in 76 to 77 when uh -huh. I first was deprogrammed. Right. And I, want, I felt guilty for all the people I brought into the Moonies. So that right. was my motivation. I wanted to get people out. And uh, it was very therapeutic for me to yeah. watch somebody uttering the same nonsense that I had during my mm -hmm. deprogramming, all the rationalizations and the deflections and the projections yeah. and all of that. But I want to I wanna, um, go straight to, to a question for you, Joe. I hear it all the time. For you, what is a cult? Is there such a thing as mind control or brainwashing? And what's your, what's your take on the, the, the digital age? Mm -hmm. and what's happening online? No, oh, big questions. But anyway, so I, I've tossed this cult word around a long time. You know, it's a, it's a four letter word, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's what I call a constricted word because it, it, it leads to a lot of things. You know, when, when, people would call me and say, you know, I've got this 30 year old child who, who's in a cult and they're brainwashed. 
like, okay, slow down, you know, because telling me someone's in a cult is like telling me they're in a car, you know, right. It, it's a vehicle for something. Right. And I want to know who's driving it. What kind of car is it? Where does it come from? Where is it made? What direction is it going? You know, is it safe to be in? I mean, it's, there's a lot of questions. So oh, to I me, what you did with that. That's yeah. Great. So I try to expand on it right away because, yep. you know, it, it, it's like, you know, if, if you're going to study cats, you want to look at the cat in order to figure out what's going on with it. You, you don't put a, you know, tigers and, and, and house cats into the same category. Right. You, you want to, you want to break it down. So the same thing with cult. Yeah. Uh, to me, you know, I've, I've uh, expanded my idea and into more of an academic perspective on this. Right. So, to me, cultus, the word cultus means to care for. Agriculture means to care for the soil. Difficult means it's, it's hard to care for. You know, so cultus means to care for something. Um, and the, the word cult basically evolved into meaning caring for something in a devoted way through a particular ritualistic system. And you could be caring for a person, an object, an idea, you know, or, 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 yep. or a political party or whatever it is. You're just caring for it basically yep. in, in a devotional way. Mm -hmm. So, and that can go good or bad, or it can just be funny and ridiculous, you know, and it can be entertaining as well. You have entertainment cults, right? Yep. That aren't necessarily harmful. So it helps to expand the conversation immediately when someone says cult to me, I want to know what kind of car is this? You know, is it a yeah. Model T? Is, is it a Lamborghini? <laughs> you know, I, no, I want to know if it runs I, ba does it run backwards? You know, I want to know what it's doing. Right? And I agree. I agree with you. And I, I say there are, there are benign cults or even productive cults and there are destructive cults. Well, to, to me, my book basically states that cult behavior has, has um, driven human social evolution, you know, so, we've been doing this stuff forever and we're going to continue to do it. We have to create symbol worlds around us in order to make sense of this mysterious world around us. And, you know, part of the symbol world is our language. Yep. Another one is, is, is our sense of, of how to uh, define the mysterious. You know, we call them gods. We call them forces in nature. We use science to do that. We create a symbol system through science, yep. you know, and, and people that are atheists tend to just, rely on that but it's still a symbol system yep I you know agree. And, and it can be wrong as scientists all know right yes they That's have to the keep beauty of the scientific method is it's a presumption right. that we and, don't and know. So, so using that model which is pragmatic so i'm a pragmatist in a sense um science changes religions that are healthy also have to change they have to argue out their formations the way early christianity did for instance they, they argued about this, you know, and it took four centuries for them to come up with what they called a Bible, right? It took a while. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then they had brilliant men trying to develop a philosophy around it. Now, you know, you, you can go deep into the philosophy and it begins to fall apart like all things do. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, but, but they had to settle on something. Yeah. So they developed a kind of a, you know, a dogma or if, if you want to call it that. And I mean, the Buddhist faith had to do it whether they're Hinayana or Mahayana, there's a particular context, a symbol context that it fits into. So there's healthier versions and unhealthy versions of that. Yep. But for me, the, the, the critical thing is moderating influences. Can the thing change when it needs to change mm. from within? Mm -hmm. and, and, and especially when there's pressure from without. Mm -hmm. you know, so the Catholic Church, for instance, went through some horrible periods, like during the Inquisition, you know, they used what they thought was the science of the day in order to uh, determine who was a witch or who wasn't, right? <laughs> or who was a heretic and who wasn't. They, they right. did things uh, scientifically. Yeah. And they recorded everything. They thought they were doing right. And so the, the, the recordings actually are very interesting because a lot of what we call our common law and the way we run our legal system is in there because mm -hmm. they wanted certain things witnesses and you know all this stuff so it wasn't completely unhealthy it's right. just that the science was really bad you know <laughs> as to how you define a human being and they had to get they had to change that and they did you know yeah. and, uh, you know and, and only recently for instance uh, pope john uh, paul ii before he died he great encyclical that he admitted that evolutionary theory is a worthy theory and we should respect it you yep. know, as opposed to since Darwin, 
I mean, the church thought it was the demon, you know, and, and today even a lot of evangelicals think it, it, it comes from some kind of a, 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 a you know, yeah. an evil uh, uh, concept that, that we evolved from other creatures. And wasn't it the 60s, the Catholic Church, the Pope said that Jews didn't kill Jesus and they shouldn't be? Yeah, they came out to that. So religions evolve. Even the Mormons, I mean, think about this. Just about five years ago, I read that they admitted that the teachings under Joseph Smith are inspired. In other words, they moved it back from being a concrete divine revelation that everyone had to believe they moved it back to an inspired kind of a teaching so that shows me some wiggle room in terms of accepting the fact that there's criticism of how the hell you know he did this through his psychic scrying and and, and umen and thuman stones and all this stuff <laughs> you know that, that he used uh, he was a very talented um uh, storyteller you know and th that talked about spiritual things you know that that you have to give him right, right. But, but, the, but did it come from God? Was it inspired? Well, that's a choice that you have to make. It's not something that, that, that's a law you have to accept is what they're trying to say. Well, the church right? actually, um, we're losing so many people because of the internet, like really devout oh, yeah. scholars started reading the original documents, etc. And um, they even changed the name from Mormons. They don't want to be called Mormons anymore. They no. want to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. So there. Well, that was they, the that was the original name anyway. But okay, but, but, anyway. but Mormons, Mormons became like, you know, a, a nickname that became yeah. like we nickname everything. You know? yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, so any other any other thing you want to talk about about you met Margaret Singer, who of course had studied Chinese communist brainwashing, and and that's how she got interested in the whole issue of oh, yeah. of uh, how people could change other people into versions of what they wanted to, or at least attempted to. Why don't you opine what you think about? about well yeah you know you and i have met quite a few of these people i mean margaret was was fascinating to me when i met her i met her at her house in san francisco yeah and she was very gracious and um you know very smart lady easy to talk to mm -hmm. um i mean you could almost uh sense that that she she was reading the inner me as she was talking to me she's very perceptive and she was uh, reading your body language yeah a lot of things you know <laughs> so uh i i but i felt comfortable around her and she, she introduced me to um, a, a number of people, including um, uh, Dr. Johnny and West. I, I met him at his house a number of times and, and got to know him quite well, too. Uh, so he, he, he was an intriguing character as well. Jolly was uh, the most hated man in the universe, according to Scientology, right? Oh, they, yeah. they despised him when he was alive. But but he was very good at criticizing them, and he had a good analysis of Hubbard's personality. Yep. I think he initially had him down as a kind of a schizoaffective or schizophrenic, by he, but he later changed to uh, uh, antisocial personality disorder. Mm. I remember in a paper he gave, mm. and uh, it, was, it was a good paper. But but those characters, you know, that, that have now passed away were a very rich part of my uh, education and, and experience in, when, I, when I was much more active as an exit counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they were great people to meet. Um, so if somebody yeah. asks you, you know, what's brainwashing or what's mind control or you know whatever term they use, what would you? How would you characterize it? How do you describe it to people? Yeah, I I um I, I you know I try to diffuse any kind of magical mystery behind it, you know, because it's basically human communication in a very um uh, leveraged and and uh, uh targeted way mm -hmm. and and it's a participatory thing in other words it's, it's a two-way street like you know yeah. as you know as a hypnotist you have to have some cooperation or you're gonna not gonna get very far with a person unless you trick them you know you get them in, in involved in something which gets them really excited and now you've got them somewhere where they're a little bit out of their center and you can start doing suggestions, you know. Right. So there's a low arousal hypnosis and high arousal uh, states. And, yeah, and by the way, that. I just want to correct you. I, I'm not a hypnotist. I am a, a, trained as a hypnotherapist. But no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't you, know, you know what I'm saying. 
No, no, no. But I, 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 I explain what I've learned about hypnosis to my clients and I pick apart whatever group they were in and I analyze some of those right. uh, persuasive communications that you... There you go. That's basically what, what I think I'm getting at and, and what you said. Yep. It is persuasive communication. I also call it um, uh, influence communication. So you're looking for a way to influence someone. Yep. And, and my... You know, I, I've looked at the models, your bite model, Yanya Lalich's model, uh, Professor Zablocki's model of, of exit uh, threats that people have. Of course, Lifton's model and his eight themes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all of these are useful um, and, and they help to contain what we're talking about. So you at least have some talking points to make it intelligible. Sure. That's the reason for these models. You know, they're not definitive. Right. Um, and, and they're all useful in that sense. So what became useful for me, because I'm more comfortable with it, is um, uh, uh, the, the idea that there has to be some kind of transcendent attraction, something that draws you out of yourself to bring you into a bigger worldview or a more, um, uh, uh, more self-esteem or, you know, it could be anything that transcends mm -hmm. your, 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 yourself at this time. Mm -hmm. So some sort of a transcendent attraction has to be there for it to begin. Then normally there's an authority figure and it doesn't have to be one person. It can be a committee. It can be an aggregate. It can even be uh, uh, just a book, you know, but there has to be an authority figure that, that begins to define what this transcendent experience is, is about because you're obviously swimming in the cosmos and you want it to make some sense. And you, now you need some kind of behavior that goes along with it, you know, well, what do I do? You know, what do I do to get saved? Well, you don't have to do anything. You have to believe, but you also have to fellowship with us because we're really nice people and we'll help you believe, you know? And so you begin to go to church three times a week. You have to also, I'm sorry, you have to learn how the Bible is and you have to learn the fundamentals, you know? So behavior modification is a really big part of belief systems. Yep. Right. All right. Totally. And what I call yeah. that Funny. is, so what I call that is, is um, orbiting, you know, where there's a kind of a, um, a, a, a psychological uh, circling. It's, it's a movement that begins where that begins to become your center of attention. Morning and night, you know, it's in the background all the time. It's not always proximal, but it's really close. It's distal. It's right there. So that triggers in the environment will remind you of this. For instance, when I was in cut, the I am and the Agni Yoga thing, colors were very important to them. So the environment was always triggering me, the blue sky, the white clouds, the, somebody wearing pink, you know, somebody wearing black, um, you know, and, and music was defined in the group as, as holy or unholy, you know, rock and roll was bad, jazz was bad, uh, certain classical music was good. Um, you know, it, it, whatever the leader says is good. It's good. Right? Whatever the leader says. In other words, the authority figure is interpreting the transcendent experience for you. And some, sometimes literally because they become a channel for God or a channel for a master or whatever. Right. And, uh, and you begin modeling yourself. And, and you know, it, and what's funny is you find devotees of these groups, like let's say the Hare Krishna, and you've noticed that yourself, people that were in the cult for some time begin to talk like their leaders. Yeah. And that clipped kind of Hindu, Hindi accent, right? And a cloned. I used to talk like uh, Japanese, Korean, American. Yeah, yeah. You just pick it up because, you know, as Marcella Trucci said, in, 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 that if you talk like us, you're one of us. So, you know, norm, we, we do this normally. You know, I know people that, for instance, um, uh, friends like uh, someone that grows up in a white culture, you know, marries into the black culture. And now she's starting to sound more black, you know, but, but this is normal for us to do this. It's not you nothing do that. that normal. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so, you know, if it becomes the focus of your attention, you become more like it. And, and I call it orbiting. It's like you're, you're moving, you're doing stuff, but that's always there essential to your existence. So the final thing, and, and I agree with Lifton here and with Zablocki is the dispensing of existence or the, the exit costs that's a blocking and I call them exit perils meaning if you decide to leave 
and you call it phobia indoctrination, but, but whatever that is, it's dangerous to get the hell out of this thing. You cannot stop orbiting. Yeah. You've got to stay in this because now that you've come to this spiritual awareness or you've, you've joined this gang or you've come into this mafia, you know, or you've joined this political party, you're going to lose your soul, lose your health, lose your life maybe if you think about, even think about getting out of this thing. And if you do, you better be quiet. Do not say anything against the system because now you've got a target on your back. You know, it's either going to be the devil's going to get you or the mafia boss is going to get a hit on you. You know, Vinny's going to follow you home. Uh, whatever it is, the, the exit cost can be heavy. And Zablocki, I think, was right that brainwashing, what we call brainwashing, doesn't really happen until you want to leave. Then all that stuff begins to conflict in your mind to keep you in the group. I mean, you and I have both known people that, that said they wanted to leave their cult four or five years before they ever broke away. Or longer. Or longer. They knew it was wrong. They couldn't get out because of these exit costs. Yeah. You know, they had investments, monetary. They had family in there. They had friends. Um, you know, th they had spiritual beliefs. And maybe, maybe the, you know, the devil was going to get me. The exit costs were keeping them, maybe even though they hated the group, you know, by that time. They despised the leader and they still stayed in. Yep. So, so yeah, so brainwashing to me is, is, is a complicated thing, but, but it's, it's neurological. I mean, there's neurological pathways that change when we adopt a belief system. It can yep. be measured. Yep. And, and they change again when you defect, when you adapt to another social, uh, broader social context. Your, your, the, the, the nature of, of the way your, your neural nets, you know, in the brain, they begin to shift around and rearrange themselves. They have to because that's how information moves around in your brain. Yeah, we're very, we're, we're yeah. learning organisms. Yes. Biopsychosocial learning yeah. beings. And we are constantly taking in information that we're not even conscious that we're taking in. That's why if you're hanging out with people or you're on a YouTube channel, watching hours and hours and hours, it, go, it, it floods you and you adapt to a lot of what you're hearing and what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. But I wanna, I wanna ask you, we're gonna need to wrap up soon, but I wanna ask you, people are reporting that um, radical personality changes are happening in family members and friends from being online and a lot of conspiracy theories and other things. What's your take on what to say to people who have had a sudden change, they're all of a sudden spouting things that family members and friends have never heard of. I know you've heard about this from cults forever, but what's your take on what's, what's the phenomenon of what's happening? Because it's happening to millions of people in very rapid um, uh, pace. Th think about this, Steve, as an artist. I mean, what is, what is the um, uh, most common shape for art to be in? A rectangle, right? When you go, and talk about painting. Yeah. So, so you going, go into... I was going round until you said a rectangle. But no, ahead. and in fact, we live in rectangles. Most houses, windows, True. doors... You know, so, so this is a deep embedded trigger already in us. And, and what are we looking at each other through? A rectangle, a frame. We have a, our experience is being framed, right? Yeah. And I mean that on many levels. I'm not, I'm not being facetious here. Yeah, no, we're I... being framed right now, you know? And, and the information that we're getting is framing us. Yeah. You know, so, so in a sense, we're being constricted by this world you know, kind of literally, because yep. we're going through this window into this other world, kind of like, you know, the, 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 the Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. she going into another world. Yep. And, and you see these wizards in the screen. You know, you're a wizard right now. And, and for all I know, you could look totally different when you get off this screen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, so... The alternate reality gaming things where you... We are in an alternate reality right now. You know, we are, we are, we are looking at paintings of ourselves mm. at this point. Now, now, we know from experience that, that we're using communication patterns, which 
which um, uh, are normal to us if we were in person. So we have that. But, but, but there is this other layer now. Now we're being inframed, right? And we're going into this other, other universe. And once we step in there, we have, we have now stepped into a, a place of compliance. Now, you know this from stage magicians. What they do when they try to get people up on stage to do their entertainment, they find people in the audience that, that seem to buy into a, a mass hypnosis yep. test. Yep. And they want the people that buy into that to come up there because they're compliant now yep. and they're going to be compliant with their voice, with their directions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether they're in trance or not. It's just that they do that stuff on stage. That's all they're concerned about, mm -hmm. you know? And so whether the person is co-conscious of doing it or completely unconscious, doesn't matter to the, the stage magician. Agreed. Right? So in the same sense, you know, you're going in this and a certain percentage of people really get enthralled with what they're hearing and seeing inside this frame, inside this other world, you know, um, uh, and, and they're meeting the wizards in there and then whatever the hell else they're doing by dialing around. And they feel like they're in control because they got this goddamn mouse, right? <laughs> they're moving it around and they're clicking and, and doing all this stuff when in I fact they already... got their phone. <laughs> then they got their Aaron. phone. Right. So, you know, and... and, and you know, so in, in, in a sense, they, they, they think they're, they're, they're seeing with their own eyes, but there's a relationship going on. And once you're in relationship, you have to give up a part of yourself through trust in order to have a relationship with that thing in there. And the thing in there, unless it's like you and I on live stream, doesn't really care about me, but you begin to think it cares about you because it thinks like you, you know, mm -hmm. that's like my idea. And you begin searching that. Meanwhile, you know, as, as we know, because the advertising world's full of this and the competition to get people into certain sites is very extreme now. And the study of human behavior has gotten to a very a high level of what makes people move and think and buy and, and, and all this stuff. Uh, you know, I love makes them vote a certain way. You mean sophisticated yeah. and advanced. Yeah, it's, it's pretty advanced. And, and so, uh, it, and a lot of people are even aware of this. They're being manipulated. But, you know, what the hell? I'm going in there. And, and so the average person is not necessarily looking for a new philosophy or a new way of life when they go in there. Right. But there's a significant amount of that going on in, in the Internet. And, uh, uh, you, you know, so... Yeah, 90% of the people are going to go in there, they're going to go shopping and they get what they want and that's it. They're out of there, right? But, but there's this whole other world in there, a world of influence going on, which, which can be totalistic. Yes. It can take over the way you think and feel. And uh, so, yeah, it's another world. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I do liken it to, uh, you know, a lot of these mythological stories that we, you know, the... the the, the Narnia stories where they go into another world through a closet, uh, <laughs> Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole. Right. You know, we, we use these terms, but they have real meaning yeah. because you're, you, you go into this other world. So in a sense, it's hypnotic, I guess, because your peripheral awareness is diminished. Like my, the room is diminished and my focused awareness is now on our conversation here. Right. And that's a form of, it's a benign form of, 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 uh, of, of focusing, oh, it's but it's, a, it's, it's one of the ways that, that a hypnotherapist state. will, yeah, go ahead. No, it's definitely an altered state, but I would say yes. that the thing that characterizes trance um, is the uh, suspension of your critical analytic thinking, your meta commenting over, and your analysis of what is happening. Um, and, uh, and, and so, if someone has an, a, a hidden agenda or nefarious purpose, if they get you into that state, it's much easier to implant yeah. ideas or to access parts of your memories or parts of your, what you consider to be part of your identity and then kind of build off of that. And, yeah. you know, like with the Nexium, you know, uh, cult, you, we're going to help you be your best selves, you yeah. know, you're going to make more money. You're going to be more effective. You're going to have better relationships. How many cults have said that? <laughs> Your career, right. right? I don't know how much time we have left. But, yeah, um, no, we need to wrap up. I have okay. one last big, big, uh, the big question. If somebody comes to you and says, Joe, 
I'm so confused. I don't know who to trust. What would you say? Well, you know, I work in a psych hospital, so I get paranoid people coming in. The police bring them in, you know, they're, and they don't know who to trust. So I don't give them any advice. I, I basically, to help them to relax, you know, I try to get them to, you know, accept the fact that this is, someplace is going to try to take care of you. Um, so I, I, I guess the, the idea is um, you're, the question is wrong. Who do I trust? Or what can I trust as far as what's the best religion? You know, and, and I try to tell them that if in, in philosophy, it's not about the, the, the answers or going to the final thing. It's about learning how to ask intelligent questions. So if you back up and break down, uh, you know, the trust world and why that even exists and why it's valuable and, and you know, do something simple with a person, guide them into a supermarket. You know, how do you know you can trust these things? You know, something which they are familiar with. And so you have the FDA, you know, you have other people shopping there. You have the fact that the whole supermarket could be sued if they don't keep a, a healthy product on, 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 on there. Right. So you can, you can kind of work the idea of how to see trust in, in a more, um, uh, sufficient or in, in intelligent or useful way mm -hmm. you know make it practical for the person make it pragmatic so that's what i would do i'd back them up from the question and begin to ask the question differently but I, i'm gonna we need to wrap up but i would just bet a <laughs> hundred bucks or more that somewhere when you're working with somebody you go back to the source of the person who was doing the group or the ideology and you go back to their history, like you were mentioning Ballard and the fraud case mm -hmm. and all of the documents under oath that came out as a result of it. And, 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 and using your critical thinking going, wait a minute, if, if, if he lied about this and if he's, a, you know, if they were taking fascist, you know, uh, ide ideas and they were practicing them and they had guns, uh, is this someone that I really want to trust <laughs> or the right. people that are espousing it? You know, so that, that would yeah, be, it works. Yeah, very good. Know, that would be an angle. But, you know, for me in, in my work with former members, one of the biggest issues is, you know, how do I trust anyone? I, how do I trust myself? I got into a cult and I talk about you didn't know what you didn't know when you got recruited. Learn about influence learn about brainwashing and mind control and and get a toolbox for yourself of reality testing strategies and mm -hmm. build a network around yourself of people you know have your back that care about you that don't have an agenda to exploit you and and learn how to trust yourself um by letting go of the shame, you know, yep, I got sucked into the moonies. It's like, right. yeah, but if I could go back in time, sitting with the recruiters, knowing they were, they were lying to me, they weren't students and they weren't part of this non-religious group, I would have said, get lost. I wouldn't have said, you know, yes, I'll come over for dinner. Right. <laughs> you know? Right? Well, you know, I, I think another way to frame it is if, if you want to be independent, you have to know what you can depend on. And that's the key to figure out what's dependable. And that gives you your independence. Great. Okay. So uh, plug, check <laughs> <Thank> out <you. laughs> Joe's uh, memoir. He has an amazing website. He's written a lot of very uh, intellectual, academically, thoroughly researched pieces. Uh, and you're starting to do some videos, uh, thankfully to pass the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom that you've accrued over decades uh, to the next generation. And hopefully they'll, they'll tap into us old fogies <laughs> and their yeah. own cult experiences so they don't get into trouble. Or if they are in trouble, they will realize, hey, it's not me. I'm not a bad person. I'm not stupid for getting into this closed system. Right. And you can change and exit. And sure, you can make you can make uh, lemonade out of lemon, Steve. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so much. So thank you very much, Joe. It's a pleasure. 
uh, I feel like we could probably do about a hundred of these, just you know, talking cases and your take yeah. and my take, because uh, you're a fascinating person. So, um, but I'm gonna say goodbye. We'll do a blog, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. So, thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity, Steve. Have a good day. My pleasure.